host sale of participant screen sharing. So. Uh, thank you everyone for bearing with our technical difficulties, but uh, yeah, I think we'll get started now. Ben has a wonderful presentation for us, so I will hand it off to him. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm here to give a talk on music technology. I'm really excited for this. I hope you guys are too. Um, so my email's over there in case anyone's, you know, interested and wants to reach out or like ask any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. And yeah, let's get started. If you ever have any questions, feel free to shout out and interrupt me. Or if not, I'll ask periodically. And yeah, let's go. So music technology. And here is our attendance code. If anyone's following along in the ACM portal and wants to get those sweet, sweet points, you can use this code right here. I think you can do it during the duration of the talk or maybe after, I'm not sure. But yeah, if you wanna write that down, it's music tech talk. And if you wanna follow along our slides, you can use this QR code right here. And I designed these slides myself and I think they're really nice. So if you wanna follow along, that would make me very happy. But if not, you can just watch up here. All right, so let's start by introducing myself. So who the F sharp is that? Ha <laughs> ha, funny pun. My name is Ben Hankin. I am a transfer student from Pierce College. I'm a senior technically, but I'm graduating class of 23. So I'll say junior. I am originally from LA, from the Valley. If anyone here is from the Valley, probably not. Um, I'm a computer science major, potentially music industry minor. And I'm also the transfer outreach director on ACM board. So is anyone here a transfer? Okay. <laughs> and shameless insta plug if you guys want to follow me it's right there and so what we're going to talk about today so this is our agenda so we're going to start out by talking a little bit about sound and the underlying physics behind that um and i know that's you know you're probably groaning internally about that but just bear with me i promise we're going to get to the interesting stuff then we're going to talk a little bit a little bit about what is music technology so we're going to go into a lot of different topics related to it it's really an enormous subject. It's not a niche field. So I'm going to do my best to address a lot of different things. Um, so if I ever go too fast, or if I, you feel like I skimmed over something, then feel free to call that out. And I'll go back and answer any questions or elaborate on anything. Then we'll talk a little bit about audio technology today. So different companies and what they're doing and how they're innovating. Then we're going to get into the technical stuff. So first of all, we're going to do the Juice API. Um, and that's a C++ framework. I'm pretty sure everyone here, if you at, if you're at UCLA and you're at least in 31, then you're familiar with CS, C++. Um, if you're not in CS32 yet, some of these things might not make sense, but I'll do my best to explain it. And again, feel free to ask questions. Uh, and then after that, I think is the most exciting part. I'm going to do a live sound design demo. Um, so I hope you guys are looking forward to that. And if you want to stay to the end for that, then let's do that. All right. So quick disclaimer, I'm the furthest, furthest thing from an expert, and I might not be able to answer every question, but I will do my best. So let's start out by talking about sound, the physics of sound. So what is sound? Sound, oh, I just realized the typo, whatever. Sound is logic. Sounds are longitudinal waves that travel through mediums, for example, water and air, and they're pressure waves. So essentially we can build a device like a microphone to detect these changes in pressure. That's how microphones work. That's how loudspeakers work. They're able to manipulate the physics of the world, essentially, to um, create, produce, or pick up on sound. Um, these uh, devices encode the information in binary. Does everyone here know what binary is? Anyone not know? Okay. For those who don't know, in case you're shy, binary is zeros and ones. We know computers can only read zeros and ones. So we have to convert everything that we want the computer to know into zeros and ones. Do anyone have any questions about that? All right. So what are signals? And I'll explain later how this all intertwines. So there's two types of signals. There's analog signals and digital signals. You've probably heard the words analog and digital tossed around quite a bit. Think a synthesizer, right? If you're playing a keyboard, a synthesizer, that's an analog signal. Or if you're playing it on the computer, something on the computer that's on the screen, that's a digital signal, right? So analog signals, if we're talking in physics and mathematical terms, that means continuous. So if you look here at this black line going through, that's an analog signal because you can zoom in on it forever. It's still gonna be continuous. It's still gonna be straight. It's not gonna be discrete the way that these bars are here. And these bars are discrete and those are digital signals. And so a lot of people like to say that analog signals are pure and digital signals are not because analog signals have a lot more information. As you can see, there's probably infinite different uh, values here for the analog signal, whereas the digital signal has only six values in that same space. So that's why analog signals have a lot more information and why a analog synthesizer is gonna have a more pure sound 
purists uh, notice a difference. You probably don't unless you're a huge music nerd like me, but it really doesn't make that much of a difference. Uh, you probably couldn't tell. So how do computers hear sound? So we talked earlier about microphones and how they pick up on differences in pressure, and those are called pressure waves. So these microphones, once they pick up on the differences in pressure, they send information about these analog signals to the computer. And this computer uses an ADC, which is an analog to digital converter, and turns it into binary. And I know that was a lot of jargon just toss you like right all at once. So let me just deconstruct it a little bit. So we have this sound wave here, right? This looks a lot like the analog signal that we had earlier. It goes into the analog to digital converter. This is in the computer and it outputs it into a digital signal. And this is what's inside the computer. And it has all that information and it's stored in zeros and ones. As you can tell here, this is binary because zero is down, one is up essentially. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. And this is stored in memory. You can use this in whatever kind of application that you want. If you wanna edit the sound, if you wanna export the sound, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. And yeah, I hope that makes sense. So now we know how computers hear sound, but how do they play sound? So there's something else called a digital to analog converter as opposed to the analog to digital, because we know that computers, the sound that's stored inside the computers or rather the information about the sound is digital, right? So we wanna convert it to analog in order for us to be able to hear it through a loudspeaker. And so how do we do that? We send the binary information to an amplifier and an amplifier can be a speaker just like this. It can be, headphones just like these and this wasn't planned I just happened to have them both right next to me and yeah so um, the loudspeaker produces the sound waves and you're able to hear them based on all that information that's stored in the computer and you send it through this digital to analog converter and it interprets that okay that was fast did anyone have any questions okay we're good so now that we know how they hear sound how they play sound how do they store sound, right? Because I've been talking a lot about how computers store sounds in binary, which is zeros and ones, but we wanna understand this on a higher level, right? We don't use binary. We know what binary is, but everything we do in computer science is kind of an abstracted version of that. So let's look at the types of files that we can store sound. And you've probably heard of a lot of these, um, but just bear with me. Uh, so the first file type is a WAV file or .wav. And this is kind of complicated, but there's two types of compression. There's lossless compression, and lossy compression. So essentially compression is when you remove information from a file in order to take up less space in the computer to store it, right? So a WAV file is lossless, which means that when we remove information from the file in order to compress it and take up less memory, you're not losing any information. It's the pure sound, the pure file. And because of that, it's a very large file size and it's very inconvenient. So for example, if we were on Spotify and we wanted to play a bunch of WAV files, it would take forever to load the songs. It would take a lot of space on your phone and you wouldn't be able to listen to that many songs. So because of that, we don't use WAV files generally. The people that use WAV files are gonna be producers or composers or people that are actually going in and working on the sounds and editing the sound. But generally you're not gonna run into this unless you're doing any kind of audio synthesis or audio editing. So MP3 files, I'm pretty sure everyone here knows what an MP3 file is. Everyone's illegally downloaded from YouTube. Um, shouldn't say that, okay. <laughs> so MP3 files, as opposed to the lossless compression of WAV files, MP3 files have lossy compression. That means that when we compress this file, we're losing information. So, okay, let me slow down a little bit. So the human ear can barely tell the difference, right? So if we play a WAV file, if I were to play a WAV file and an MP3 file, and I probably should have prepared this beforehand, but if I had a WAV file and an MP3 file of the same song and I played them both, you guys probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference because there isn't that much of a difference or rather the compression algorithms are so good that we can't tell. And because of that, we generally like to use MP3 files or similar formats. They use way less information. They have a much smaller file size. So they're much more practical for streaming and sharing and those kinds of things. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So now that we know what MP3 files and WAV files are, um, there's a lot more formats. There's FLAC, there's AIFF, there's AUG Vorbis, which is something we're gonna talk about later on in the presentation. But essentially all you need to know is that WAV files are for audio professionals and MP3 files are for the common man that's not worried about what's going on behind the scenes. So that was kind of a lot right there. That was kind of the basics of sound physics and how sound is stored and played and blah, blah, blah. So let's go into it in a different direction now. So let's talk about what is music technology because this presentation is about music technology. That's the title, but what is music technology, right? 
So the official definition is any device, mechanism, machine, or tool used by a musician or a composer to make or perform music. So on the left there, we have a digital audio workstation, which we'll talk about later. Then we have a microphone and we have an analog synthesizer. So these can all be considered music technology. And these are all obviously wildly different things. And so because of that, music technology is a very, very broad thing. And it's impossible to talk about everything and kind of summarize everything in this short talk. Um, but just know that there's a huge world of music technology out there. And yeah, we're going to talk about a little bit of it today. But we don't want to talk about just music technology. Because let's think about it. A podcaster would use a microphone, right? A film scorer would use a synthesizer. And a digital audio workstation can be used by a lot of people that are editing or manipulating audio. So instead of calling it music technology, let's refer to it as audio technology for the time being. Um, and as I said, music is just one thing that can be created using audio tech, digital audio workstation. It's not digital music workstation. You can have podcasts, you can have movies, TV shows. All these things have audio and it's very detailed, the amount of work that goes into the audio that you don't even realize. So let's talk a little bit about, a little bit more about digital audio workstations. And in a few minutes, I'll do a quick demo of the one that I use. Um, so a digital audio workstation, I'll call it a DAW from now on just because to say myself the words. So a digital audio, I just said I would call it a DAW. <laughs> so DAWs are computer applications. They're used to arrange, record, sequence, and mix sounds. If you don't know what that means, that just means making music, essentially. So music production, you need to do all these things. Film scores, you need to do all these things. Scene dialogue, you need to do all these things. And here are the names of some notable DAWs. FL Studio is in bold because that's the one I use. Let me do a really quick demo of that. So it looks extremely complicated. Oh, this is not how it's supposed to look. Okay, so it's empty right now, but as you can tell, there's kind of a lot going on here. It took me a very, very long time and a lot of frustration to figure it out. And even then I would say I only know maybe 10% of the functionality. So if this is something you're interested in, this turns you off just by looking at it, don't, okay? Like, just bear with me. Just do your research and eventually it'll all come together. It's a very complicated thing, but if you put in the work, you can figure it out over time. So I kind of just earlier arranged something really quickly. Um, I'm just gonna play it. It won't say. Doesn't look like it's playing. Well, that sucks. Hmm. If I stop sharing you that. Okay. Well, anyway, that was gonna be the piano from Someone Like You by Adele. Moving on. Okay, so these are, these are all just the names of notable DAWs. You can, there's lots of pros and cons to the different ones that I won't bore you with right now. If you wanna know which one you should use, feel free to hit me up. I can give you some advice. Um, they're very, very pricey. There are lots of free versions. There are a lot, I should not know what to say. Um, and yeah, I use FL Studio. I like it, I enjoy it. I think it's very user-friendly. And if you wanna get started, that's a good place to go. Um, then contrary to DAWs, there's something else. So DAWs are kind of just one half of the coin of music technology in terms of on a computer, right? We have something called Virtual Studio Technology or VST for short. It doesn't have a nice little acronym that I can say DAW-like, so we'll just say VST. So VSTs are essentially meant to emulate live studio recording technology, right? So if I wanna play a guitar, for example, I can't do that on a computer. So we have to create something that emulates that. So there's two types of VSTs. There's VST, VST instruments and VST effects. So in short, VST instruments, like I said earlier, you can have a guitar. It's not actually a guitar. It's just emulating what a guitar sounds like by looking at frequencies of guitars and timbres and things like that. Sorry, that's also a lot of jargon there. But essentially, you're just replicating a guitar without actually playing a guitar. And you have synths, which are pretty much everything for music, right? You can create all bunch, a whole bunch of sounds, like sounds that aren't even real, sounds that don't exist. You can create that on a computer by manipulating it. And then on the other uh, side of it, we have something called VST effects. So VST effects, this is a really, really big one. It's kind of the core of audio processing. So equalization, we'll get into that later. Um, digital reverb is kind of like the echo in the room. We'll also talk about that later. But essentially, VST effects are just, we have this sound. Now, what are we going to do to perfect the sound? What are we going to do to change the sound? What are we going to do to get the sound to sound the way we want it to sound? Does everyone, does that make sense? Okay. Any questions yet? No? Okay. And so here's just a quick example of one. This is called Auto-Tune. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard of Auto-Tune. But if not, Auto-Tune is essentially when you have a singer or you have an instrument that's playing a sound and the pitch isn't right, or at least the pitch isn't what you want it to be. 
So you can go in and you can manually change the frequencies of the sound in order to make it the tune that you want to be. And so Melodyne is just one of the auto-tune products. There's a bunch of them out there, but everything you hear on the radio is drenched in auto-tune. So if you can't sing like the radio, don't worry. Okay, so let's talk about audio technology today. And I think I'm kind of breezing through this, so I'll slow it down a little bit. Um, but audio tech today, we know there's a lot going on in the audio world, right? Spotify is this big up and coming company. We have Apple Music, which is competing, but not as good. Uh, we have Tidal, which is even worse. And then there's Amazon Music, apparently that's a thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so let's talk about audio tech today. So music streaming. Um, I would be surprised if anyone here didn't have some kind of music streaming, even if you're not paying for it. We've all heard of Spotify. We've all heard of all these. Maybe back in the day, you used Pandora. Apparently, that's still a thing. I found that out yesterday. So music streaming is kind of a less technical concept, but we're going to talk about it anyway, because I think it's really important to understanding the kind of landscape of sound technology today. So music streaming is kind of key to the democratization of music and technology. Before we had music streaming, we had illegal downloading. We had, you know, you manually go and you buy an album or you buy a song, and that was obviously very inconvenient for consumers. It was a little more convenient for labels and musicians, but really not so much. So when Music Stream was introduced, when Spotify was founded in 2008 by Daniel Ek, who I think is a genius, he kind of changed the shape of the music industry. And over the past 13 years, it's kind of morphed into something that you would have never expected it to become, right? Where you can just, for $5 a month for college students, you can access any of 70 million songs that you want at any point in time. So instead of paying $12 for an album that you'll probably listen to for a week and then put on the side and buy another one you're paying five dollars a month for 70 million songs and all the podcasts and all the stuff that comes with it which is crazy like we don't appreciate that we live in that time if we were here 10 years ago like we would only have two favorite artists but you can have thousands of artists saved in a playlist and shuffle it and just a song comes on that's crazy um but yeah so by show of hands who here has spotify that's literally everyone okay i was gonna say apple music but... On you guys. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Spotify. So how Spotify works is they store all of their audio inside the Google Cloud, right? Um, I don't know if everyone here is familiar with the cloud, but essentially it's, it's not, I've been saying essentially a lot also, but Google Cloud is, gives you appearingly infinite storage, right? And that's the same with AWS and Microsoft Azure. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. So the cloud is kind of an innovative technology that allows us to store a lot more information than we can store on a local drive. Um, and so Spotify takes advantage of that because Spotify has, as I said earlier, 70 million songs plus podcasts, plus whatever other information they have. And so by utilizing Google Cloud, they're able to continue growing this enormous library. Um, and this, as I said, revolutionized the way consumers listen to music and podcasts. Well, let's talk a little bit about what makes Spotify successful, because I think a lot of people take it for granted and don't understand why Spotify is so successful, why it's so appealing. I mean, obviously, literally every single person in here uses Spotify. Also, I'm curious, who here is paying for Spotify? Who here is using the free? Okay. So actually, I think it's something like 45% of people are paying and 55% are using the free version. So that kind of aligns with what we have here today. But let's talk about what makes Spotify successful. So first of all, Sophisticated data collection. That's so important. Everything is about data. Every tech company, well, not all of them, but the, the ones that matter, they all use sophisticated data collection. They have a ton of data. They use this data to craft algorithms. In Spotify's case, it uses, it creates recommendation algorithms, right? We all know Discover Weekly. We all know Release Radar. And I don't know if everyone here uses it, but a lot of people do. Research has shown that the vast majority of people do use these playlists. And not just that, but there's also when you play a song on a playlist and, or on an album and you run out of songs, it starts recommending new ones. That's also using Spotify's recommendation algorithms. And these algorithms are so successful compared to Spotify's competitors. And that's kind of what makes Spotify stand out because that's one of their very few products and it's their main product, as opposed to Apple, which doesn't invest necessarily in that because they have so many other products and Apple Music was only created as a competitor to Spotify. And then another thing that I find really interesting about Spotify is its intelligent branding. First of all, what other companies have green except for Hulu, but who uses Hulu, right? Like we have a very clear brand, very clear cut, and then they use it in really great ways like Wrapped. Does anyone here not know what Wrapped is? Well, you all use Spotify, so you should know what Wrapped is. But Wrapped is, in my opinion, a genius, genius concept because it's free marketing. So the way that everyone here, almost everyone is wearing 
a brand on their shirt, right? I'm wearing Amazon, Matt's wearing Nike, Ash is wearing ACM Hack. Everyone is wearing, oh, me as well, UCLA. See, UCLA as well, right there. Okay, so everyone is wearing a brand. And so Spotify took advantage of this, but instead of wearing shirts, we're posting it on our Instagram stories, right? At the end of the year, everyone takes the screenshot of their Spotify wraps and they post it. Not everyone, most people. I didn't either last year, but most people did. But essentially, I stop, need to stop using that word. Okay. But yeah, this is free advertising for Spotify for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's FOMO, right? Because Apple Music doesn't have anything that even compares to Wrapped. They have similar you know, tools, but it just doesn't have the branding of Wrapped. And so by posting this on your story, it's giving everyone else that doesn't have Spotify FOMO. Because like, I want to know what my music stats are. I want to know what my most played song is. And that's really just brilliant. And every not everyone, most people are posting this on their story. It's free advertising and it's genius and it's all at once, right? So it's like this insane tidal wave and the <laughs> title's another streaming service, but it's failed also. Um, but yeah, um, so it's just this huge wave of advertising and marketing that happens all at once. It's like a blitz and Spotify has reaped the rewards of that uh, brilliant strategy. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about Spotify and some context, let's talk about the underlying technology, which is what we came here to talk about. Sorry for that detour. So let's talk about a little, instead of like, we know that Spotify stores all of its data on the cloud, but let's talk about some different technologies that Spotify has created. So a very recent under the radar one, which you probably don't know about unless you specifically gone out and looked for it, is something called Spotify Pedalboard. And what it is, is a Python library that Spotify released. It was created by Tim something, I can't remember his last name, um, but it's the, I'm not gonna say the word. So Spotify pedal board, it's often used by data collectors for efficiently adding effects to audio. So we talked earlier very briefly, but we're gonna talk about it more later. We talked about equalization or EQ and we talked about reverb, right? Which is the echo in a room. So what pedal board does is it automatically applies these effects to audio, to a lot of audio, right? So if you have a hundred audio samples by creating a short script, you can add reverb at a certain level to all of this audio at once. And that's used internally by Spotify for data augmentation and machine learning, which again is just a lot of buzzwords. But what that means is that Spotify is using all of its data and it's applying these effects to data in order to analyze it in real time. You know, stuff that would have taken a long time beforehand, but now we have Spotify pedal board. So pedal board, yeah. Rock or like jazz or something. Like, what does that sound like in our settings? Right. So, those are types of reverb. Like, um, that's not how pedal board works. Pedal board. Yeah, that's, that's board. yeah, that's not pedal board, but that is something that you can do in a lot of DAWs and VSTs. Um, you can kind of just choose a bunch of presets and um, based on how you want the reverb to sound, like jazz or rock, as you said, there are a lot of, you know, paradigms for how the reverb has been applied in those genres. And so, I think that's what you're talking about. Kind of. It's just like you can like like you can do do low key stuff on Spotify app. Like you want more. Right. Yeah. So you can. Yeah. So that's um a similar effect. Like you can do EQ through pedal board, and you can also do EQ through the um, Spotify app. But the purposes are different because EQ you're just doing it for your own personal preference. Whereas with this you're doing it for like if I have a thousand samples and I want to cut out a certain frequency on all those samples, I just make a Python script and I say, this is the frequency I want out. And it just does that on all the files automatically. And why would you do that? Um, in a lot of different machine learning research, uh, it might be helpful to do that for different reasons. I don't know that much about research nor machine learning. So I wouldn't be able to answer that question really well, but there's a lot of documentation about it if you want to read up about it later. And I can send you some stuff too, if you want. It, like, everything, everything is based off of like user, uh, like, um, I guess, interactions where you're like, oh, this frequency just does not sound as good. Oh, no, no, no. So I should clarify that. So this isn't a user-facing thing. This is a back-end thing. So this is something that a data analyst is going to use or something that someone doing machine learning for Spotify is going to use or for whatever company. This is a Python library. It's not something that you can use with the app necessarily. Does that make sense? But like, very, like the data analyst is like taking out these frequencies for the, the, the library itself, right? Like, not necessarily, I mean, you could use it in that application, but I don't think that's the intended um, way of using it. It's um, when, whenever you're doing research, you have, you know, a large pool of data and you want to do, you want to have a control group and you want to have something where you change the control group, right? So in the non-control group, if you want to take out all that 
uh, all those certain frequencies in order to compare how things sound, for example. So pedal board automatically does that. Sorry, does that make sense? Um, I have a question, why would they want to, like, like, like maybe this is my misunderstanding of what Spotify actually does, but like, is Spotify, Spotify gets music from artists, right? Right. Spotify isn't gonna, Spotify, I don't think, legally is allowed to change the, like, the music right. that the artists give them, right? Mm -hmm. So by adding effects to the audio, doesn't that inherently change the, the music? Right, so this isn't adding effects to any of the audio that's provided to them by artists. It's rather something for them to do an anal anal analysis on the back end. So I talked earlier about how one of Spotify's big reasons for success is that they have a lot of data and they do a lot of research on that data. So this is how they do that research. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, and so it's uh, Pedalboard uh, is built on the Juice API, which is something I mentioned earlier, but we're gonna talk about it more in depth later. It's a C++ framework um, and it's, a lot to take in, but if you know your data structures, it's something you can figure out if you want to. And Spotify pedal board has a lot of different effects. Some of the main ones being compression, gain, distortion, reverb, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about that later. Any other questions before I continue? Okay, cool. So Aug Vorbis. Remember when we talked about MP3 and we talked about Wave and I said there was something called Aug Vorbis? Chances are you've never run into this before this hour, right? Because neither did I before I made this presentation. So Aug Vorbis. Similar to MP3, it's a lossy audio file type. So when we compress Aug Vorbis, we're losing a lot of information about the sound. However, that sound is not discernible for the average listener. So this is kind of an algorithm that's improved on the MP3 compression algorithm, and Spotify uses this. So when you're playing a song on Spotify, you're listening to an Aug Vorbis file, as opposed to what you probably thought was an MP3 file, or probably didn't care. But yeah, so Aug Vorbis files are very small, but they contain almost all of the necessary information in order to produce the optimal listening experience. Yeah. Um, so I think that if you're downloading the file, then you're saving the Aug Vorbis file directly to your phone. If not, then you're streaming it off of their cloud. So another company that I want to talk about is Dolby Laboratories. Who here has heard of Dolby Atmos or Dolby in general? Okay, it's cool. So uh, Dolby is a company that works in audio noise reduction, encoding and compression, and spatial audio. And that is all just a bunch of buzzwords that mean nothing, so let's simplify it. So Dolby essentially allows you to listen to music or sound as if you're actually listening to it, as if you're actually engulfed in it, right? So if I'm standing here and there's a fan working on my computer that's in front of me, but there's some like a buzzing from the light that's above me, and there's someone walking in the hallway and that's over there, so when we listen to music, we can only hear it out of two ears, right? So we can hear it in two dimensions. But Dolby Labs and Dolby Atmos, that's the technology that this is, it's allowing us to emulate listening to sound in three dimensions. And so they've been working on a lot of movies. I know they did uh, Dune with Dolby Atmos. If you use Apple Music, you can listen to a lot of stuff in Dolby Atmos, waiting for that to come to Spotify. I'm not sure it's taken so long, but might have to get the free trial of Apple Music just to test it out. All right, uh, and they have a lot of other technologies like Dolby Surround, Dolby FM, and Dolby Vision. There's like a long list of 100 things that they do if you want to check it out. But they're also a really big audio company um, that's kind of at the forefront of audio innovation. So Dolby Amos, I mentioned earlier, um, it's kind of 3D sound. So instead of having, does anyone here know what panning is? Sorry, I've been doing this a lot. Okay, so panning is essentially... Panning is when you have sound in two dimensions, so you can hear it on your left and you can hear it on your right. And so you have those parameters. But with 3D sound, you're adding a height parameter. So if a basketball is bouncing up and down, you can hear it down here and then up here, but it's also bouncing in this direction. So you're hearing it like this the entire time. Whereas if you were listening to it on a regular panning, you would just be hearing it like this and it would slowly be getting softer. So by adding the height parameters, we can interpret sound as if it's in 3D. And that definitely improves the user, uh, the consumer experience quite a bit, and the listener experience, I should say. So you are the center, and all the sound waves are constructed and placed relative to the center point, and they create a more realistic sound environment available on Apple Music, but we don't use Apple Music here. <laughs> so some other audio companies I'll just briefly talk about. So there's Splice. Uh, it's a cloud-based music creation library of samples and plugins. So what that means is that if you're someone that likes to make music, or if you know what samples are in music, then that's kind of just like when you take audio from something else and you put it on your song. So Splice has an, not an infinite, but a seemingly infinite library. It's subscription-based. You can take whatever samples you want. You pay for them with credits and you can add them to your songs royalty-free. 
And then there's something else called OS Mix, which is automated audio mixing and mastering. So if you don't know what mixing and mastering is, that means nothing to you. But I think this is a really, really interesting startup because mixing and mastering is essentially a process. I said the word again, mixing and mastering, and I'm going to stop pointing it out too. Okay. Mixing and mastering is a process that takes a long time. It's when you're perfecting the sound. It's when you're making it, making all the instruments distinct from each other. If you're doing a podcast, then you want to make sure the voices are coming from the right direction to create realistic effects. And so this does it automatically, which is a huge game changer. It's also putting a lot of people out of a job, which I think is funny, which is not funny. Um, so it's really interesting. It's probably going to become more and more a part of the audio interesting industry as we go along. You'll probably hear more about it. And then finally, we have Synlim. So Synlim, I can't do justice for it. So instead, I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about it. Then we're going to watch a video. I also need a break from talking. So Synlim is a prosthetic synthesizer. And yes, you read that right, a prosthetic synthesizer. So let's see if it's going to load or if you can hear. Are we connected to the speakers? It's fine. That's not good. We connected to your computer. Actually, that might take a while. So, right, the same issue we had in the run through. Okay, well, um, essentially, this guy has a prosthetic arm. This guy has a prosthetic arm right here and it's a synthesizer. So he created it so that his mind can control the sound. It can control different knobs on his synthesizer, which I think eventually we'll get this working and we'll be able to do that. So just JBL should. Um, and yeah, we'll watch the video later when we get that set up, but it's really, really crazy. It's like you can mind control a synthesizer, which is just unbelievable. And the implications that has for a bunch of different technologies are just amazing. So we'll come back to that. Until then, let's talk about the Juice API, which I brought up a few times already. So the Juice API is a C++ framework. It's a library. And what that means is it's a bunch of different, um, sorry, Zender. It's a bunch of different functions and variables and classes and objects that we can use in order to manipulate sound and create GUI. And that's too technical, so let's not get into that. But basically, Juice API, if you want to make audio applications, if you want to make a DAW, if you want to make a VST, you need to know the Juice API. So I'm going to uh, talk about it a little bit, and then we'll go into the example. So it's an open source C++ framework, as I mentioned, used for developing audio for desktop and also mobile. And yeah, you said all this. And that's the logo there. It's pretty cute. All right, let's look at a code example. So I didn't get very far yet, but I'm planning on it. As you can tell, this is pretty complicated. If you've taken CS31, you probably don't have the knowledge yet. If you've taken CS32, you definitely do. But it is a pretty huge learning curve, and it's something that you have to really put in the work and understand it if you want it. Yes? Absolutely, yes. The programmer, that's a YouTuber who's done a really large amount of videos on it. Um, and if you want to learn any specific thing, he, his videos, like every single one is entry level. So if you want to check that out, go for it. I've done a few of them. I think they're really interesting and very helpful. Um, but yeah, again, you probably are going to need CS32 knowledge to get into that. Um, you can go into that before it if you want, but it might not make a lot of sense. Uh, and yeah, so here's just an example of a CPP file from using the Juice API. As you can see, there's a lot of functions going on, just a lot going on in general. And you can use all these different things that do a lot with audio processing. Is it working? Okay. Does anyone have any questions about this? 
Yeah. There might be, I haven't looked into it. I can look into it after. Uh, I can turn the, wait. Well, Still not working. Okay. I'm trying. Hi, my name is Bertolt, and my biggest idea. Hold on. It came from the projector. <laughs> Wait, just turn the speaker off for a second. Yeah. Passion when I'm not working or spending time with my significant okay, so other. let's take a minute to watch this. If this doesn't load right now, I swear. In my procedures, but this can only understand the signals from single electrode and turn it into control voltage that it outputs up here. And once we got that to work, um, we got, we in this case is Kizzy from Kuma Electronics and myself. And Kizzy actually, believe it or not, sat down in his spare time and designed a circuit board, a specific, like a custom circuit board for, for my needs, um, like a two channel amplifier that's like tailored to the specifics of the electronics in my arm. So uh, my husband Daniel was so cool to 3D print this adapter that fits to this part from the old broken hand prosthesis. So basically, I can now pop off my hand and um, I can show you. And pop this on. And if I now switch this on. There is a control light here indicating that it's running. And then there is these two LEDs up here that indicate the CV output that the device reads from my muscle signals. So now I can plug a cable like this in here and use that to do things on the modular synthesizer. So, for example, um, let's listen to a little sequence I was playing. So a simple sequence running through a filter. Right, a filter here. All right, I can move close. And then now I can do is plug this in here and control the filter with the electrode markers. And the thing is, okay. did, did everyone get that? Did anyone not understand what just happened? Okay, cool. I think that's really just fascinating. This guy can just think about it and the filter changes. Like, how crazy is that? So personally, I don't have a prosthetic, so I won't be able to use it, but I hope they, you know, do a lot of really cool stuff with that. You know, there, I think there's a lot of applications for it. You can do a lot to help a lot of people. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that pans out. Okay. And on to the last part of this talk. Wow, that was fast. Okay. So sound design, I know a lot of you came here just for this. So what is sound design? And I should put it in present mode. What is sound design? Sound design is changing the qualities of a sound wave, which we talked about earlier, to produce a new timbre. So what that means is I have a sine wave, right? We've all seen sine waves. So I can change the sine wave to go like this maybe, and it's gonna be a different sound. And you can do a lot with sound design to do a lot of different things with sound. And so what we have right here, kind of hard to see, but this is a synth. This is a digital synth or a VST, which we also mentioned earlier, a virtual studio technology. So we can take a sound here, we can apply a lot of different effects, we can change a lot of different things about it, and we can make the craziest sounding sounds. So at the end of this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this synth and I'm gonna do it live, yes. I am new to free time. What is timbre, what does that mean? I should have specified. 
So tem timbre is very, uh, first of all, it's pronounced timbre, which is so weird. There's an I in it, like who, who thought of that? But um, timbre is the quality of a sound. So when you think of a saxophone, it's distinctly a saxophone, right? Yeah, so then there's piano, which is distinctly piano. And a big part of timbre is the very first few milliseconds of a sound. So there's been studies done that if you play, if you take off the first few seconds of a sound, which is called the attack, and then you play it, people wouldn't be able to tell what it is. So they took off the first few seconds of a piano and then a trombone, and then they played both. And 50% of people got it right, 50% got it wrong, which means essentially, no, I said the word again, which means nobody knew, nobody could tell the difference. So that's what timbre is. Timbre is the first few seconds, which is the attack, which gives a sound a quality that makes it distinctly that sound. Did you have something to add? Or no. You play the saxophone. Wow. Okay. Very impressive. I can never play the saxophone. The VST sax is disgusting. Yeah. Every VST is honestly garbage, but I'm not allowed to say that. Okay. So we're going to go back to the synth later, but until then, I want to get into the basics of sound design and how it works on a low level. So there's two types of basic sound design. There's additive synthesis and subtractive synthesis. So additive synthesis is adding sine waves together to create a specific timbre. So we have this original sound wave here that's bright. We have this original sine wave right here. It's just a normal sine wave. And then we have the second sine wave here with a double the frequency, or it's not double, but is it double? It has a different frequency. And then we add these two together. Like if you look at the diagram, we're just adding the two waves together. And we have this sine wave right here which is a different way, oh, I shouldn't say sine wave, this is not a sine wave. We have this third wave right here, which happens when we add these frequencies together. That's what it produces. And this third wave here is gonna sound entirely different than these two. Well, not entirely, it might sound similar because it has similar shape, but it's gonna sound different than these two. And the point of this is that we, any sound that you can imagine, any sound that can be created is really just a bunch of sine waves added until you get that sound. And obviously it's not practical to physically go in and add every sine wave until you get that one wave that you want. But this is how it works on a low level. This is how computers understand it. Obviously it's more abstract than that because computers only understand binary, but on a low level, that's how it works. Yes. The sine wave. So this is the amplitude and this is the frequency of the sine wave. So the amplitude, um, I should know this. The frequency is how often it oscillates, right? So if I have a sound that's going like this, it has a frequency of something per second. If it's going like this, it's going faster than that. It has a higher frequency. The amplitude is the loudness. Can someone confirm that for me? Yeah, maybe decibels. I think that's right. So, so is the y-axis here the decibels? The y-axis would be the decibels, yes. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's like, correct. I'm asking what the unit is on the... I wouldn't be able to answer. It's what? I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure? It probably is then. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. So then we know what additive synthesis is, and now we're going to do a 180 on this picture, and we have subtractive synthesis. So it's the opposite. It's just removing information about the wave to affect the timbre, for example, a filter, which is something, again, we're going to talk about that later towards the end. So we have this original wave, right, that we didn't take from the previous slide at all. And we have this wave and we want to remove these frequencies from it. And we end up with the sine wave. That's all it is. And just like with additive synthesis, where you can add sine waves infinitely to create any sound you want, you can do the same thing with subtractive synthesis. You can remove as many sine waves as you want from any wave to get any wave that you want. Finally, we're going to talk about effects. And this is going to be kind of a lot to take in, so I'm going to try to take it slow. Um, and I won't get too much into detail into any of them because these are all very complicated concepts, but let's go through them one at a time. First one, equalization or EQ. This is probably the most important thing in sound design. It's removing or highlighting frequencies. And what that means is when I play a sound, it has low end, which is the lower frequencies. It has the middle frequencies and it has the high frequencies. So the low end might be the bassier sounds, whereas the high end is the pitchier sounds, you know, the ones that hurt your ear, the higher you get, you know, like a dog whistle is a high frequency, right? So equalization is when you go in and you remove the frequencies you don't want. And this is extremely important in everything audio technology related. You need to know EQ. You need to not just know how to do it, but understand how it works and why you do these different things, why you remove certain frequencies. Um, so definitely get very acquainted with that if you're planning on doing anything in audio technology. Any questions about that? Okay. 
Uh, then we have compression, which we talked about a little bit earlier when we talked about files, but it's adjusting levels and file sizes. When I say levels, I mean kind of the volume. Um, so think about it. If I'm creating a song and I have a guitar and I play the guitar and I record it, then I have a piano and I record that, then there's a vocalist and I record that, and there's all these tracks coming together, they might not be at the same volume. So what I do with compression is I get these to be the same volume, and I also remove information at the same time. And what this does is it decreases the file size and it makes it more consumable for the listener. Does that make sense? Okay. Reverb, we also talked about briefly earlier, but I'll try to explain it a lot more broadly now. So reverb is we're in a room, hit this, that sound bounced off the walls, right? It's a very wet sound. There's a lot of different reverb going on. Sorry if that woke anybody up. Um, so reverb is the echo of the sound. It's the sound waves bouncing off the walls and coming back. And I think there's not much reverb here because these are all over the walls. What are they called? Soundproof. So not good for the example. But in a normal room, depending on the room size, you're going to get different types of reverb and also depending on the loudness of the sound. If you're in a huge hall, you know, in a concert, for example, there's going to be a ton of reverb on the artist or on the singer or on the instrument or whatever it is. Um, and similar, if you're in a small room, if you're in a tiny room, and you play a sound, there's not going to be much reverb. It's just going to be a dry sound. Does that make sense? Okay. Then we, yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. That makes sense. Right. Because if we no. Right. Yeah, I'm negative decibels. That makes sense. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. I think you're right. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. So we know what reverb is. Then we have delay, which is delay. So delay is when I hear a sound and then I hear that sound again. So this is different from reverb because reverb is kind of the immediate echo of the sound. Whereas delay is when I hear that specific sound again. So if I were to like hit this and then you would hear that exact same sound again, or maybe you would hear a lower volume or whatever different effect. Usually you zip, but it's especially in pop songs, everything is delayed. It's pretty crazy. Like every single way it makes sense. So I said that chorus has multiple tuned voices. That's kind of... Complicated... A chorus in it because that you're gonna have different pitches and they're a chorus. So you can do that um, digitally, artificially, with a bunch of different tools, a bunch of different VSTs that have been developed. And then we have distortion. Um, so think about if you've ever listened to a punk song and it sounds really grating on the ears out of nowhere, um, that's distortion. That's when you're increasing the gain for a fuzzy effect. And what that means is when you're increasing the volume and you're increasing and you're changing the way the waves go. So if I have a sine wave and I want to distort it, then I'm going to make it go like this, but at the bottom and at the top, it's going to go flat and that distorts the sound, which is a little technical, but that's kind of how it works. And I don't know how else to explain it. So I don't have any questions about it. Okay. So there's also a plethora of other effects. There's really so many things you can do with um, sound, but these are kind of the main ones. These are the ones that are in most songs. Um, most things that you're going to listen to are going to have at least some form of these effects, if not all of them. So moving on, I think this is our last slide. No, it's not. I mean, yeah. So vital. Vital is what we're going. What I'm going to do my demo on in a few minutes. But vital is a free visual synth developed by Matt Titel, and it's if you want to get started in sound design, this is the way to go. It's free. It's kind of difficult to pick up, but there's so much content, so much educational content about it on YouTube for free. It's really the way to go. It's how I started and it's still the synth I use. So I highly recommend it and I'll explain how it works soon enough. Um, there's so many effects, so many oscillators, so many wavetables, and I'll explain what that means and very large capabilities. 
So sound design, go for vital, don't pay money. So with that, thank you. And I'm going to transition into the sound design and we're gonna see if that works. Yeah, thank you. All right, so can we hear this? So we're gonna to have to use my speaker. Okay. Or can you hear it on that computer? Yeah. Um, sound well, let me double check that. That? Wait, am I even playing it? I should mute myself. How important that is, that's what we're doing here, filters. So here you can see this orange part, these are the frequencies that are gonna go through. And if it's not in the orange part, we're not gonna hear it. So right now what we're doing is we're filtering out all the high ends. So if I play the... I forgot to load it. Is that working? No. So this is with all the frequencies. If I filter out everything except for the very low end, you can only hear the very bassy tones, which you can't even hear that much because this uh, wave does not have much bass. Then if I do only the high end, again, you can't really hear anything. And you choose a different wavetable for this. I'm not very nice at playing. So that's the high end. And then if we do the low end, eh, whatever, you guys get the point. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Is there a change with like the type of note you play? So like you if you do like the, the lowest note on the piano, then you'll hear like Yeah. So yeah, the lowest notes will have Like that that that's what you would hear in the lowest string band, right? Right. Because the lower notes have lower frequencies in their I don't remember what they're called, like in overtones. And then if I do it all the way on the highest, you're not gonna have much lowers at all. And if you like switch it, then you'll only hear the highs. Right. And then if I put it back, oops. And that's the low end coming through. Okay. So now that we know all of this, before we get into the actual designing a sound portion, does anyone have any questions? Anything they want me to clarify? Because I know this is a lot. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious. Are you interested in stuff like digital signal processing? Or like, do you like just being abstracted above, like, here's a band pass filter? Right, so as a career, I'm looking at digital signal processing personally, but um, it's not something I know that much about, so I don't feel comfortable talking about it. If anyone wants to talk about it with me afterwards, you know, feel free to reach out, I'd love to. But for the purposes of this, I know sound design much better than I know DSP. So we're just gonna talk about that. Any other questions? Okay, cool. So now let me show you guys some stuff I've worked on. And again, I'm also kind of a beginner, so this is a synth that I made called Pillow, and I used it in a lo-fi song that I made. Oh, that's too far away. That's way too loud, hold on. So yeah, that's called Pillow. And then I don't remember what this one sounds like. This is called Shimmering Ocean Waters. And I remember this one sounds kind of weird. 
This is called Waves of Nostalgia 2.0. sub bass and the kick and then illuminated ocean I think I made that one recently bells I guess um, and yeah that's kind of just some of, some of the stuff I've been working on it's pretty elementary but I've been using all the stuff that I talked about earlier the filters the I've been doing all that stuff and now let's make one together so I'm gonna just start us off but then I want you guys to give me your opinion then we're gonna do based on what you think we should do so let's look at this thoughts we played wait what that's not sauce we played is it yes it is okay sauce we played sauce we played yeah So uh, some of the sounds that I make are for songs that I've written, um, but a lot of the stuff is just me experimenting and just seeing what I can make. And if it fits a song that I've written, then I might use it there. If not, then it's just, you know, just for fun. Okay, should we use the Sawtooth Wave? Yes or no? Okay, that's what I thought. I guess I'm also curious, do you, when you compose a song, do you start from a certain element? Like, do you start with a kick or like a snare or a hi-hat or something, or do you kind of just like... Um, well, this is specific to me personally, but I'm a songwriter first and foremost, so I write the songs, I write the words, I write the melody, and then in my head, like, I'll gradually come up with where the kick goes, where the hats go, where the different instrumentals come in, and stuff like that. But that's, you know, different for everyone. A lot of people start, I mean, it's industry standard to start first with the track, which means the B and the instruments, but that's not how I do it, because I'm wrong, I guess. Who knows? So yeah, so let's look at the sine wave instead. Yes, no? Eh. Let's do a harmonic series then. Sounds like you're dying in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's try a little. Is that better? We can do a lot with this. Sine waves are very, what's the word? Not camouflage. You can do a lot with it. A chameleon, there we go. Sine waves are a chameleon. You can do a lot with them. Okay. Huh? That was cool. I like yeah. that. So. Now let's work on the sound envelope. So we see here when I'm playing this chord, there's an attack. Do we want the attack or do we want to get rid of it? Get rid of it? Or do we remix it? So this is with yeah. the attack? Oh, there it is. Get rid of it? No, no, keep it. Keep yeah, it? But it says it's like lo-fi. I mean, the chords you're playing are lo-fi chords. Right, these are definitely lo-fi style chords. So you want the attack then? Okay, let's keep the attack then. How about decay? Do we want a long decay? No. no. Is that better? No. Shorter? It's not smooth enough. It's not smooth enough? So what do you want me to change? The sustain or the decay? Uh, the sustain. Sustain? Okay. And can you make it shorter too? Yeah. Oh, I feel like it sits better to keep it like sustained for a while. For a while? How does that sound? Also, part of it is how long I'm holding the key for. So why don't I? I think on my ear, this is your ear too. Huh? Can you change the position of that? Of the. Yeah, so instead of like a higher concave curve, can you make it like convex curve? Yes, I can. Do we want to do this instead? Yeah. You like that? Okay. Cool. All right. Next, let's do a low filter oscillator on the level. So a reminder: this is just it's gonna cut out the volume at a certain frequency that we determine. So let's play it with this regular one uh, half frequency. No, I don't think so. So let's put it all the way up at 64. <laughs> what if we just don't have a filter for this one? Let's not have a filter? I don't know. It sounds like the, if we're going for like a smooth vibe, right? Do we want a fluctuating thing? What do you think? Hmm. Well, we might want to put this filter on another lower wavetable that we're going to add later. That's a good point. So let's take this off for now. leave all the frequencies in. Do we want to cut out the high end? No. Do we want to cut out the low end? Doesn't really make a difference, does it? I think the low end better. 
Do you like Lauren better? Yeah. Or just like Lisa? Maybe like a little bit, but yeah. A little too much. That's what I think, okay? Anyone have any issues with that? Are we good? Okay, cool. Let's add another wave table. So sawtooth, first of all, let's take this off. Sawtooth. No. We don't like sawtooth here. Maybe a square wave. Thoughts? It sounds aggressive. It sure, is aggressive. Like whatever. Yeah. yeah. What if we put this envelope here on the level for the first oscillator, turn that off? And then we'll create another oscillator here. We'll or not an oscillator, this is an envelope. We'll take off the attack and let's try this. Still pretty aggressive. So that's not helping. Okay, so. It's hard because it's like an 8 bit vibe, you know? It is, yeah, because it's 8 bit is. Um, right, because we only have a certain amount of. So this is less complex than 8 bit, actually, because this is technically 2 bit, a square wave. So let's look at some other random ones. Let's drink the juice. <laughs> Interesting. It's garbage. You like that? Yes? Okay. And let's apply this to the level here. Or actually, no, that doesn't make sense. Let's not do that. Okay. So. If we add this oscillator to the filter where we were cutting out all the high ends, let's hear how it sounds. Eh. Let's do it on the second filter. Okay, do we like that? Okay, what if we added a low filter oscillator here to the level, frequency down? Is that good? Put them both together. What was that? So let's make it a little slower then. Is that better? Okay. And then let's add some white noise. So this is gonna sound like, excuse my language, shit at first. <laughs> Keep. So let's start out by dramatically reducing the level to very, very low. Kind of gives it that aged oh, effect, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's too much. Thoughts? Do you like have one of those plugins that like randomly adds like the defects kind of to mimic analog? Like you know what I'm talking about or not really? Yeah, so you can do a lot of that through Vital. Mm. Flat or not. <laughs> okay, so do we like this one or do we want to add something more? Maybe a low end? I feel like it's missing something. What if we took this down an octave? I feel like it's also maybe not sustaining. Maybe what? It's not sustaining as well. So do we want to, you mean decay? I mean, you, are you just like, maybe you're just taking your fingers? Right, so when I take my fingers off the keyboard, that's when the decay starts. Oh, okay, then maybe we're just talking about the Like that? Oh, uh, cool. I like that better. Okay, so let's add a bassy sound. I'm gonna go with uh, harmonic series. I'm not letting you guys choose on this one because I like this one. But we're gonna put the octaves down a lot. Um, what was that? I can't hear you. Too much oscillation. Too much oscillation? I don't think there is a, oh wait, I think, I know what you mean, sorry. Too low. Thoughts? Okay, do we wanna filter out? Wait, I can just do this. Let's filter out the high end. Those, the three notes you just played kind of sound like 
fun one I've done. It's so nice to sit down for a while. Yeah. I turn very morbid. [laughs] Let's just call it summer. All right. Let me know when you're ready. All right, well, that's the end of my talk. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys learned something. Again, if you have any questions feel free to reach out. My email's right there. I'd love to answer, yes? Oh can you play the someone like you know, the someone who was able to get a confirmation email? Let's see. Yeah. So I, I was trying to do this when I was demoing that Apple Studio. Let's see if it works. Do you have to change your avatar? You have to create an avatar. You can create a new one. Yeah you need to, Apple Studio is kind of garbage, low key, so I have to close this and re-open it. Oh man. It's such a waste. [inaudible 1:27:58.42] What's your password? [laughs] I think it might just be my computer session. Yeah. Or you can use your email. Or you can use some sort of Skype login. Yeah, my computer's up to speed. Okay, you guys get the idea. Ryan. Thanks for the question. [laughs] All right, well, yeah, that's it. That's the end of the conversation. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Woo! Gonna have some fun. [laughs]